Hello everyone, I'm Nadia Belov and I'm, I'm going to talk to you about um, the work our team did in trying to understand how to improve the turnaround process on aircraft. Uh, so once we've all taken a commercial air fl flight, we understand that once the plane lands, they have to turn the plane around for the next flight. And that may mean that um, maintenance crews come out, they check whether the tires have the right uh, tire pressure, whether the oil or what have you is, is um, uh, at the appropriate level, and of course, if the airplane is gassed and if there are no other anomalies. So we've all been in a situation where we've landed, uh, boarded a plane and they discover there's a, a problem with the plane, we have to deboard plan has to be fixed before it can move on. You can understand the financial implications of uh, managing such issues. There are implications in terms of the time that it takes to turn around, the number of people that have to maintain uh, the airplanes, um, also the, um, the problem of modeling how many parts and which parts to keep uh, where and the costs associated with overstocking them. So there are quite a few technical challenges that must be overcome in order to maximize I mean, we are Lockheed Martin. We maximize um, cost, or try to maximize cost, and minimize the time spent on maintenance, and in fact, service more customers. So you could see here uh, the typical, in this case, uh, where we observed this work, the typical uh, structure of uh, the turnaround process, the process of turning around a plane that has just landed. Uh, planes come in uh, on the flight line, uh, their remote workstations, uh, various technicians come in and um, perform uh, diagnostics and then figure out what to do with the airplane. It is either confirmed to be completely in great shape and can be turned around just gassed for the next mission, or it needs to have um, repairs. So what this project entailed was to, we, there are two goals really, to understand how to capture the turnaround process uh, and then also to model it with the hope of improving it, to understand whether where there are bottlenecks in the human and machine um, uh, teaming, so to speak, where if you look, if you think about it in a in a conveyor belt sort of a, a methodology, where there are bottlenecks with who's holding up the line, so to speak. So, first, uh, we went on. Uh, we went to uh, a place where we could observe how this happens and developed an as implemented model, and that is a mental model of how this process really happens today. And then, in order to uh, bootstrap this model, we uh, collected data, implemented a, an application, an app on a mobile device where we had observers observe the process of turning around planes. We collected the data and uh, performed cleansing of this data, and I'll talk about what that means um, for this process. And then um, in order to understand the nature of, uh, in order to model or uh, take account of the nature of the different Different people uh, perform things a little bit differently, even if it's the same task, and, and we can all do it with slightly different speeds. We um, developed distributions for some of these behaviors and implemented them into the anti-logic model. So then we built out the anti-logic model, ran simulations, and were able to identify where there are bottlenecks um, and where things that were not obvious um, to the people who were executing this process, where there are um, uh, par where parallelism can be introduced. So if you look at this, uh, in any given situation for turning around an airplane, you have three main components. You have the airplane, you have the people, and then you have the workstations or the machines. And um, this is sort of a, a flow, this so shows a flow of the three interacting together. Um, so Taking that flow into account, we developed an app that captured the data. So the idea here is observers, uh, technical staff, were able to go on the field and observe this process, as I already said. They had a little uh, tablet with them, and for every time uh, an, uh, an engineer or um, Mechan I don't know, people who were turning over the planes, were working on this, um, every, any time they started and maintained a task, a task could be um, started, you just pressed a button and the timer started and we would measure what this task took for this particular airplane, this particular mission. Um, there were predetermined tasks that we had already known about, but as, of course, this is um, real life, um, there are some things that happen at the turnaround process that are not accounted for or modeled uh, by our app, so they were able to, I don't know if I can, 
Um, so they were able to um, enter a new task, um, create an audio snippet description or a textual description of this task. And so that was also, uh, that data was captured. So the, the, the task that we were, each task that was recorded and, and modeled and monitored it can be decomp decomposed here into the model of how this process um, occurs. And by that I mean we have, um, we have the plane that lands and, that in, and the plane is sort of going through, the plane with the mechanics goes go through these different stages, right? So you check the oil and if the oil's fine, you check the tires and if the tires are fine or if the tires are not fine in this case, for example, you will end up um, repairing it. There are distributions associated with each of these tasks, how long it takes to do the task. If there's a delay, um, if there's a decision not to fix a particular problem, which can, which can happen if it is not a significant problem, um, to inhibit the performance of the next mission. And um, so there are distributions on how long it would take to, to perform the task, how long it would take to repair, um, if it can be done, if it should be done. And also we even model things down to the detail of um, the paperwork that is associated with the process. There are many um, data collection challenges that we ran into when we started monitoring or modeling this process. And specifically, um, we found out that the people who are turning over these airplanes, they're not necessarily doing this in a linear fashion. In other words, airplanes aren't just landing one at a time and standing in a queue. They are perhaps checking one plane, and if that plane requires further diagnostics, they may step away and, and do something else. And so the workflows for each airplane as they're being turned around are not necessarily synchronized. They're, they're sometimes in parallel. and so the the ability to capture this um, uh, was, um, was imperative in understanding how to model this process. So what we did was we um, developed uh, uh, the ability to hot swap the workflows in each airplane's whole process of the turnaround process is like a workflow. So we developed the ability to hot swap the workflows so that a, uh, a data collector assigned to a station, to a workstation, could just switch between um, different airplane workflows as they um, observed what was happening. So, and I already alluded this to this earlier, uh, that different people work at different speeds. They have their own quirks, their own preferred way of accomplishing something or other. And on top of it, different collectors of data also have the same uh, quirks. So, um, what we noticed after we started collecting the data was that some tasks had taken, uh, the, the variability of the length of task was very significant. Um, and we needed to be able to uh, account for that, to model that, to see what the variability was and to try and trim the data and fit the data, things that were outliers and then really understand if there was such a, a big variability. So um, we uh, set up what, we were, what are known as unusual events and anomalous events and then we also started to accumulate the data, uh, look at the data per task and also look at the data per aircraft to see if uh, one task took longer for somebody, the other task would take less time, and in the end, the turnaround process was the same or not. So um, what I'm trying to allude to is in order to use something like AntiLogic and in order to really benefit from it, you have to have data that's, that's pretty accurate. Um, so, but in, if you look at the results that we were able to achieve with, it, with this is that uh, we were looking at the data on the whole, we were able to quantify the variabilities and understand why they were happening and really be able to attribute them to then verify that we were correct in our um, understanding of the process and altogether. Um, we were able to also reshuffle how we looked at tasks. We combined certain tasks and aggregated them and then we decomposed certain other tax tasks at a later time and revisited this process after modeling the the turnaround process in AntiLogic to understand how we can then suggest the augmentation of the turnaround process, the physical uh, process that is at the, at the plant. So the process that we took for the development was first we wanted to understand what, it, what currently happens, what is the as-is process. We wanted to understand what kind of data collection requirements are needed to how granular it would be. Do we need to model every single small task? Do we need it to model, if we needed to model uh, tasks on the aggregate? 
Um, and to understand the type of data. So this is where having audio notes and text notes were important because they provided some well-needed rationale in, in the uh, loads and loads of data, I mean gigabytes of data that were collected just for single days um, of observation. Then this helped us, uh, infor this informed us how to implement the anti-logic model, which you'll see is, is pretty flushed out, and then um, having done that and populated the data, we were able to run Monte Carlo simulations to see how this process works, where the bottlenecks are, and then propose and suggest changes. Maybe that is it. That might be it. I don't have any screenshots of our uh, actual simulation here. Um, however, uh, the fact, the ability to use AnyLogic or using AnyLogic allowed us to model both the people and the machines, the people, the airplanes, the workstations, and in concert to really understand who, what aspect of the turnaround process was the bottleneck and um, how we can reprioritize. So what we ended up doing was running the simulation in the as is with the data we collected, proposing changes, making the modifications to the anti-logic model, and re-simulating the same Monte Carlo um, experiment and uh, being able to showcase uh, quite a sizable improvement in um, the total duration, the work turnaround workflow. So that's it. Thank you. I'm just curious, how long did the whole process take, and you know, what, which step takes longer than the others? How long the process to collect the data and create yeah. the model took? Uh, the, data process, the data collection lasted for a few days, a week, a few weeks, so probably maybe 10 days total, uh, but that's because we wanted to have quite a sizable sample. Uh, the model development process took a few weeks. The Monte Carlo simulations didn't take that long to run, and then um, there was a significant effort, a few weeks worth of uh, proposing changes to the process, which included physical um, augmentations to the turnaround setup. How many people did you actually uh, get to track and input the information into the mobile handset. So how many people were actually doing the tracking and the process with each of the planes? So what was the size of the sample? Uh, I believe between five and ten. Uh, Tim is my colleague. Yep, between five and ten, depending on the day, the staffing we had. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You called it human interface design for process model. I understand the process model and you are finding variabilities in the, in the process. Uh, wh what is the human interface part? The human interface part in this particular process, uh, there's a lot of involvement between the person, the technicians that are working on the airplane and checking the airplane and the actual system. So for each step and whether, they're not, whether or not they're checking the tire pressure, for example, they are required to document their, that they're checking the air pressure or the tire pressure on this particular airplane. They're required to do the diagnostic, record the results. So there's a lot of back and forth between the the uh, mechanic or the technician and the computer they're working with. And we found that um, so oftentimes the number of minutes that it took for them to interact with their computing device to enter this information, which must be documented, um, was significantly more than the time it actually took to perform the task. So what we were trying to do is mitigate um, the, the workflow of all these technicians in such a way that uh, it, it, one person's documentation process did not hinder the next person down the pipeline doing whatever they're doing. And so um, there's, you know, there's a constraint number of machines that are available for the mechanics. There's a constraint number of parts. Sometimes they would have to call to see if a part is available and so on and so forth. So there's a constraint number of people and there's also a limited number of machines and we had to make sure then they do things their own way. Um, how can we suggest that they change their entire physical setup? If you can imagine a giant hangar aircraft hangar, how can they change their entire process or augment their process in such a way that somebody down the line isn't just sitting there waiting because the guy here is typing up his report or because there may be a part available that they can put on this plane. Did they come to a conclusion about a way to put more time into actually fixing 
issues with the aircraft, that is increasing turnaround time as opposed to doing data entry? Did they find a... Uh, yeah, we did, we, we did find ways, um, whether they were to paralyze certain tasks or to remove certain activities altogether because they had no statistical significance on the health and viability of the airplane in the long run over across some, some number of uh, sorties or missions. So you have more customers for this as opposed to this one customer? And you were talking about maximizing cost. I didn't quite get that. Well, because uh, if you're if you're um, an airline and you are going to have to s uh, spend lots of money on spare parts and tires or what have you, right? Sensors, tires. Um, this all can feed into the supply chain management of a giant air asset. So um, this kind of we've moved on from this work to model uh, failures now. So instead of just looking at how long it takes to, once an airplane lands and how long it takes to um, uh, figure out whether something's wrong with it and turn it around, we're now modeling failures to see if we can predict the likelihood that that airplane is going to need extensive service by the time it, that it lands. And so that going together with understanding how to make acquisitions and, and uh, uh, of sensors and parts, what parts are more important, you can really understand then uh, in terms of space and also money, but more importantly money, how, to, how we can model what to get, when to get. It's just, a, it's just the same thing as a car manufacturer trying to figure out on their assembly line what parts to buy, when, and how to store them just on an airplane um, uh, platform. Thank you very much for the opportunity.